Good evening. Uh, this lecture, Bezrat Hashem, will be Lerefuat Adar Chaya Bat Irit, Sima Bat Aisha, Yora Bat Ella Esther, also Refuat uh, Yael Bat Alice, Refua Shlema, and Lemiriam uh, Bat Simcha. Hopefully, her surgery went well, and she has Bezrat Hashem Refua Shlema. Also, Leavdil, Leiluy Nishmat Tamara Bat Shifra. And uh, I guess that's it. We cover all the names. Baruch Hashem, as you can see, you're probably wondering why we have such big chairs here. Whenever you see big chairs like this in a synagogue, then you know there was a Brit Milah there, circumcision. The way they did it, as you can hear the music from downstairs, they did the Brit Milah just before sunset, because that was the eighth day, before it got dark. And the party, the meal, and the music after sunset. The good news is that every place that there was a circumcision, that means Elijah the prophet has to come there. And his spirit remains in a place for three days. So now we are, we having today a lecture with Eliyahu Navi is to the, together with us in, in a lecture. It's the, by the way, it's not the first time I give a lecture when Eliyahu Navi was in the audience. It happened a few times in Yeshiva, when we have Brit Milah, when we say Divre Torah, but this is an opportunity. Sometimes we do the Brit Milah on Shabbat in the house, because we can carry the baby. Then Eliyahu Navi stays in the house, the spirit of Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, for three days. Why Eliyahu Navi has to participate in every Brit? Because Eliyahu Navi, when he spoke against the nation of Israel, he was, he was a zealous, zealous uh, rabbi, Eliyahu Navi. And Eliyahu Navi had complaints about them, what we call kitrug, mekatreg. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I want you all to also to see the positive of them. You have to see how they're willing to circumcise their babies in such a way for the sake of heaven. And it's, by the way, you should know, the circumcision, mitzvah brit milah, it's mitzvah with mazal. Mitzvah with good fortune. What does it mean, mitzvah with good fortune? Some mitzvot, some mitzvot has no good fortune. Some mitzvot have good fortune. What does it mean, good fortune? I'll give you an example. Some mitzvot people love to keep. So almost everyone keeps them. Everyone keeps them. Some mitzvot almost nobody likes to keep. Not always you can find logic. I'll give you an example. Mitzvah of Shabbat. An eternal covenant between the Jewish nation and the creator of the world. What can be greater than that? Unfortunately, close to 80% of the Jews in the world do not keep it. A massive tragedy. A disaster. A tragedy. What is, what is a tragedy? 80% of the people are not even aware what Shabbat is. Then you have another mitzvah, mitzvah of taharat ha-mishpacha. Between a husband and wife, family purity, the woman, mikveh, all these things. Most women do not even know what it is. You go to Israel, you ask all the secular women, I have no idea what you want from them. They don't understand the impurity of nida, none of these things. Shabbat and nida, it's a punishment of karet. If a person violates those rules, the soul is being cut in the afterlife permanently. Shabbat is also death penalty, even worse. Also death penalty. People do not know. This mitzvot do not have mazal. But there is a mitzvah that has a great mazal, Brit Milah. Almost all Jews in the world circumcise their babies. Almost everyone. 
It's very, very rare to find a Jew that had a baby boy and he doesn't, he doesn't circumcise him. It's almost impossible. Maybe, maybe one out of a thousand, maybe, from what we see. So what do we see? Even though mitzvah brit milah, it's the mitzvah that people should have not kept because it's painful, you're hurting a baby, the women are fainting and crying and they can get overexcited. It's a painful mitzvah. So people should have run away from it. But reality, people sacrifice a lot to circumcise their baby. In Kamen Istrasha, people used to walk in the snow, in the forest, the Moel, for days to circumcise the babies under the ground. Because if they catch them, they'll send them to Siberia. It was against the law to be religious in Russia, in communist Russia. So people actually, even secular people, they actually risk their life to circumcise their babies. Why? This is a mitzvah with mazal. Some other mitzvot has more mazal, some mitzvot has no mazal. The Gemara said, the Chachamim say, Akol talui b'mazal, afilu sefer Torah shebaichal. Everything needs a good fortune. The fortune comes from Hashem, obviously. For whatever reasons, yes. Even what Sefer Torah you take out of the Ark on Shabbat, it's also Taluy Mazal. Why? Well, I'll give you an example. You have nine Sifre Torah inside. The Gabai looks, let's use this one, takes it out. Once he takes it out, almost every Shabbat they're going to use it. Because now you finish this parasha. On Mincha you have to read next week's parasha, so it's already there. So you read again next Shabbat, and the next Shabbat, and the next Shabbat. Then it comes Rosh Chodesh, you have a different Kriya. You don't want to start roll the Torah, so you use a different Sefer Torah. So one Sefer Torah is good Mazal. You use it on Monday, Thursday, and on Shabbat, three times a week. The other one have less mazal, once a month. Then there is another one maybe set for the holidays, Pesach, once a year. Another one set for Rosh Hashanah or Kippur, once a year. So what do you see? The person that donated the Sefer Torah, two people spent so much money, one got lucky that his Sefer Torah is used frequently three times a week, the other one is less lucky, once a month. The other one is less lucky, once a year. Even we Sefer Torah will perform first in a synagogue. Everything is, of course, in the hand of Hashem. Depend who donate the money, how clean the money is, how great is the Sefer Torah, how kosher it is. Depends on many, many things. Many people are not aware of the importance of tefillin and mezuzot. Tefillin and mezuzot. Tefillin and mezuzot, it's mamash a matter of life and death. Especially mezuzot, when you put mezuzot in your house, you put mezuzot in different rooms. If chas v'shalom, one of the mezuzot is not kosher, missing a letter, or one letter touched the other, or one letter, for instance, they made the vav short and it looks like a yud, or, may, or they make the yud too long, it looks like a vav, or they make the resh too short on the top, it looks like a vav, because the letters are very similar. One or two millimeter, more or less, change the, change the letter. Or sometimes they write the aleph, it's diagonal vav, and two yud. One of the yud is disconnected from the vav. That's also a problem. Or, or, they did not leave enough space in the second parasha, they have to leave nine letters. They didn't leave enough. Also a problem. Bottom line, Rabotai, tefillin and mezuzot is one of the most important thing in life. When it comes to your Mercedes, and your Porsche, and your Ferrari, and your mansion, and your vacation home, you are very, very large. Very generous. Let's buy this, let's invest here, let's spend 10,000 extra here, 20,000 extra there. I want the car with special wheels. I want that extra system, 700, 500, 2,000. Throw it in. 
When it comes to tefillin and mezuzot, don't you have cheaper? Do you know how long does it take to make a pair of tefillin? To make the, the batim of the tefillin, from the minute it was a cow, until it becomes those black boxes that you put on your head and your arm, it's a process that takes many months. It's a whole process. Everything is handmade. There are different levels of uh, tefillin. Some tefillin they use electric. The machine does some of the job. Some machines they use electric but they hold their finger on a button. Meaning when you leave it stops. That's a higher level. Very rarely you can find tefillin like the one I bring from Israel which is 100% handmade, without electric. All with a primitive way, with pedals, with the hands, mamash like this. Without glue, with no, without shortcuts, without any, any attempt to save on time. To do it the original way, like it was in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. Very, very difficult to find. Why? First of all, how many pairs they can make? It's not commercial. Without machine, it takes four or five times longer to make. But not only that, if you already make the batim, the highest quality, the best leather, you don't want to put parshiot over there that is not the best sofer on earth. So what do you do? You have to get sofer that is riding is the highest level. But there is something that is more important than the, the quality of the riding. What is it? The quality of the person. Is it a holy Ben Torah, someone that devotes his life for Torah and holiness? Someone that watches his eyes? Someone that doesn't have a smartphone? Someone that doesn't know what internet is? Someone who never looked at the screen of a television? Someone that watch 100% what comes out of his mouth? Someone that goes every day to the mikveh and purifies soul. Someone who prays with devotion. Someone who has a beard, like a sofer, doesn't cut it with a razor or all kinds of other things. There's a list of things which you want in a person to have. And of course, have a certificate every year. They have to get tested and renew because there's a lot of laws to know. Chaz v'shalom, you forget some of the halachot. You can make the tefillin or the mezuzot pasul. So, Rabotai, the conclusion of what we spoke about now, you have to be very, very, very careful. You don't buy tefillin and mezuzot in stores. Judaica. Forget about it. The owner of the store doesn't know who the sofer is. Someone come, a broker, buy it from here, sell it to him, sell it to him. It's a market. Do you know who the sofer is? You're going to put your life into someone else? Anonymous? Don't know who he is? How do you know who made the batim? Do you know how many batim, when you open it up in the head, there are separation? It's supposed to be aligned. Most of the tefillin in the world are not aligned. They make fake lines. Those lines that you see, if you put a thin razor, it's supposed to go all the way down and separate them to four. But it's very difficult to make it. So what do they do? They make a separate, uh, like, a, like, a, like a line. Like it looks like a line. But if you try to open it, it's not going to open. It's, gonna be, it's crooked. Why? According to some opinions, it's not kosher. There's a lot of things to know. Believe me, if you, I do it for my, my, what, more than 25 years. After 25 years, I'm still learning. There's always something you didn't know before. There's so many things to know. So that's Rabotai, and plus, of course, after all of that, you don't want to spend on a good quality tefillin. The Ashkenazim pay in Borough Park six, seven thousand dollars on a good pair. Not that, not everyone can afford to pay so much. So the idea is to get the same thing, which less than half a price than what they pay, or a third of a price. That's the idea, to help people to get the best thing for very, very low price. And that's not easy, because in Israel the prices every week go up. Almost every week. Everything go up. You order, by the time you come to pay, it's already 10% more. And the next uh, two or three months later, again. Why? Inflation. One thing we are lucky, we are lucky that the tefillin is not made in America. 
if it was made in America based on the $20 an hour that they pay a worker, then they w you would not be able to get a high quality tefillin for less than $10,000 based on the amount of hours they work on it. Because over here the labor is very expensive. Not like in Israel, they give them a few dollars an hour, $10 an hour, whatever it is. Over here everything is double and triple. So that's, by the way, just for us to know a little bit about the importance of tefillin and mezuzot. Remember, there were cases that people used to get heart attack. One heart attack, second heart attack. They opened their mezuzot and they saw in the word levavchem, something was wrong. Your heart. In the mezuzah, it say your heart, the word was erased, or the one of the letters had a problem. It caused the owner of the house heart condition because the mezuzah wasn't kosher in the word heart. Sometimes people had problem with their children. Either they couldn't have children or they had children with sicknesses and problem. They checked the mezuzot. What did they see? They found that the word benechem is erased. Your children is erased. Or... What is going on here? So, I give you one personal story just for you to understand what we're talking here about. 20 years ago, when I moved to the house where I live now, we did Hanukkah Tabayit. We prepare all the mezuzot, we roll them, we put them in boxes. I invited all the bachurim of the yeshiva. I said there are two ways to put mezuzot. I'm going to have to put one by one, which would take me two, three hours. Or I will give each bachur yeshiva one mezuzah and tell him which door he, he puts it. In five minutes we finish the whole thing. I make the bracha on the main door, everyone answer amen, uh, go quickly to their door, stick it over there, everyone puts only one mezuzah, we have more than 20 people in the room. Everyone take one and put it. And that's what we did. After a few years, I have a son, he was three years old, today is, uh, today is 21. So we're talking here now, this story is about 18 years ago. My son doesn't speak, three years old. Cannot say a sentence. Here and there maybe barely say a word, but something very, very scary. Three years old doesn't speak. Some babies speak at one year old already. We took him to a specialist in Westchester. He checked his uh, brain. Do this, do that, move the hand, touch this, put this together to make sure the brain works, that there's no autism. And so everything is fine. The kid is fine. Why he doesn't speak? It has to be something else, but there's, there's no problem with the brain, with, the, with functioning. A few days later, my wife comes to me and says, I want you to check the mezuzah in the room of this kid. I said to her, why? She said, I had a dream that there's a problem with his mezuzah. I said to her, it cannot be. We got the best mezuzot on earth. The best, the highest. Cannot be any better. It cannot be. It checked and checked again and checked with computer. We're talking top so fair. They don't mess up, these kind of people. She said, I'm telling you, you should check it. I said, okay, I don't take it serious. Then she said, did you check the mezuzah? Check the mezuzah. Okay, you want me to check the mezuzah? I'll check the mezuzah. I opened the screw in the bottom. I want to take out the mezuzah. What do I see? It's empty. One box, someone of the Bachurei Shiva closed without putting in the mezuzah. It's an empty box. He put the mezuzah in his room without the actual cloth inside. Just an empty plastic box. I said, wow. All this time, three years, there's no mezuzah in this door. 
Immediately I got a mezuzah, I prepared it, I put it in. The next day his rabbi from yeshiva say, wow, I'm shocked. He doesn't know about the story about the mezuzah. The next day, he started to talk non-stop. Unbelievable. Mama, a story that happened to us. Why do you see Rabotai as a result? It's life and death. Sometimes people would suffer 10 years because they were cheap getting mezuzot. Don't you have something cheaper? Sometimes people come and say, why do I have to pay 100? You know, in a store, a good mezuzah can be $300. We don't, obviously, we bring it for much cheaper, but just for you to understand, it takes three, four hours to write. The cloth and the person that makes the crown and the computer check, it's already more than $20. Before he starts, he's cost the sofer $20 just to have the cloth and to check the mezuzah when he finished. He has to make some money after three, four hours of work. So sometimes people say, oh, they, over there they sell for 60, 70, 50, whatever. Of course, what do they do? They go to all the beginners. Every mezuzah they started to write, it's all crooked, all questionable. Possibly kosher, possibly not. Depends who you ask. And they want to get rid of it. There's a lot, I don't want to say the word garbage, after all it's holy thing, but it's a very, very low level. So they have accumulation of them. They sell it, just, just pay me for my cost, for the cloth, to cover my cost. Same thing Megillot, Megillat Esther. Most of the Sufrim, when they begin, they practice on Megillat Esther. Why? Because Megillat Esther doesn't have the name of Hashem. You can erase, you can fix. It doesn't have the name of Hashem. In Mezuzah you have the name of Hashem. If you wrote the name of Hashem, you cannot erase. That's it. You have to bury it. But Megillat Esther, it's a good practice. So a lot of Sufrim, the first Megillat they write, has a lot of corrections. It has a lot of erasing and all. Plus, it's not in a high level, but they have to sell it. The class costs a lot of money. So they sell it for thousand dollars, whatever it is. Why? Just to cover the cost at least. But when I bring Megillot Esther, actually I just brought three Megillot Esther from Eretz Israel, unbelievable. It looks a hundred percent like a print in a book. One letter is not crooked, not left, not right. Not one letter big, one letter small. Every letter is solid. You don't have questions. No erasing, no black marks. And the most important thing, the Sufrim has to be all fully devoted to Torah. Torah, none of the nonsense of the world today. Why? Because the Sofer puts his holiness into the mezuzah, into the tefillin. You put this, it's a covenant with Hashem. Tefillin is one of the three covenants in the Torah. Shabbat, Brit, Tefillin. Shabbat is one covenant, Brit Milah. It's another covenant, and Tefillin is the third. Three times it says in the Torah, Ot. Ot means a sign. It's a sign you belong to me. Hashem said to the Jew, what are the signs? Shabbat, Brit, Tefillin. Now Tefillin, you can buy from some uh, modern modax sofer with the jeans and sandals and long hair listening to women sing on the radio while he's riding the mezuzah or the tefillin. What kind of holiness you gonna have in this? Zero holiness. What do you think? Hashem is, uh, is blind, he doesn't see who wrote it. What kind of spirituality you have in that? When I, when I once spoke about the, 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 the biggest matmid we had in the history of our, of our yeshiva, Rav Eliyahu Buchbut, today is the head of the Bedin in Bet Shemesh. Av Bedin, genius, 30 years of non-stop devotion for Torah. Also as yeshiva for boys for high school in Kiryat Gat. Serious, serious, very serious. 18 hours a day of holiness, Torah, teaching, in a Bedin. When he writes Tfilin, first of all, you know everything is 100% according to all the halachot. There's not one halacha he missed. Why? When, you, when you're knowledgeable, you have power, you know everything. Everything is according to all the chumrot, according to all the shoot. Besides the beautiful writing, there is Kedushah. 
because when he sits to write me tefillin or mezuzah, that's after 10, 11 hours of learning Torah. Even in a bed in his Torah, all the halachot, dine mamonot. Someone that his life is full of Torah, he puts the holiness into what he writes. I, every time I go to see him, when I go to Israel, I clear two, three hours time. I know not to make a, an appointment right after. Why? Because once you begin to talk to him, it's three hours of Givre Torah. It's like, a, like the Niagara Falls. It doesn't end. And this and that, why? When a person, Baruch Hashem, is addicted to Torah, only good things come out of it. Now imagine every day you put something like this on your head and on your heart. What does Hashem look? Hashem sees that you have to feel in the highest level, in the best quality, with the best software, in the highest level of holiness. That's a mitzvah, the way it should be. That's what's written in the Torah. Ze li van veu, Elohe aviv aromemenu. What does it mean, ze li van veu? This is my God. And everything that he commanded me to do, I will do in the most beautiful way. What does it mean? Not just to do it because I have to. Mezuzot, the best. Tefillin, the best. Moel for Brit Mila, the best. Rabbi for my children, the best. Yeshiva, the best. Buy, you need to buy things for the house, whatever, the Brit Dusha, everything the best. Why? Ze Eli Van Veu. Nobody can ever lose for investing for the sake of heaven. So that's now for those who came late. Today we have a shiur with the presence of Eliyahu Anavi. Once Eliyahu Anavi comes to the place of the Brit, his ruach, his spirit remains in a place for three days. Three days. So now, Baruch Hashem, we have the schut to give shiur when Eliyahu Anavi, Zachur Latov, is right here with us today. So let's move on. We read on, para, on Shabbat, Parashat Ekev. The parasha begins, Vaya Ekev Tishmeun. After you're going to hear, the Rashi explained, Mitzvot kalot shadam dash be'akevav. Person, when he walks, most of the weight of the body is on the heel. The heel, if you walk barefoot, the heel carry most of the weight. If the heel is not strong, they cannot hold the body. The heel in the Shona Torah, it's called Akev. Akev. When Yaakov came out together with Esav, he was holding his heel. Why they call it Akev in the Torah? Because Akev comes from the word Me'akev. Even though Me'akev it's with Chaf, but that's what Esav said, Ikvani pa'amayim. Yaakov was delaying me from coming out by holding me. Akev means ankle, the area of the heel. When a person walks on the street, the last thing he cares about is the things that he steps over, right? You walk on the street, you have some sand. You walk over the sand. You walk over the sand, that's the baby of the brick. So, how many babies have the, the mazal and now we're after the brick to be already in Shior Torah? Huh? So, Rabotai, as uh, the Akev mitzvot shadam dash ve'akevav, what you step on with your legs, you don't care about. That's an expression to, see, to say, some mitzvot people do not respect. If you tell a person that keeps Shabbat, do you love and respect Shabbat? Of course, Shabbat, a covenant with Hashem. You respect the feeling, of course, kiss it ten times, make sure it doesn't fall on the floor. You're not allowed to think anything else when the feeling is on you, or to talk something else without, besides the tefillah. You give respect. You mezuzah, you kiss the mezuzah, you give respect. 
There's a lot of mitzvot that automatically we respect because we know they are very important. But some mitzvot we neglect. We don't care so much. Who can give me an example of some mitzvot that people not so respecting? Shabbat. Huh? Shabbat. No, Shabbat. If people keep Shabbat, they respect Shabbat. Those who don't know about Shabbat, they don't care about Shabbat. Those who keep Shabbat, obviously Shabbat, they understand it's important. My Mahronim is lazy now. He sits two steps from the sink. Ma, will I wake up? Will I get up now? Go around, make my Mahronim. Yalla, we'll manage without it. Big deal. My Mahronim, not the end of the world. Well, it makes me less tzaddik. I'm less righteous because of that. Some mitzvot the person set in his mind. Ah, that's not so important. I can manage without it. One more mitzvah like this, speaking in a synagogue in the middle of Daveni. On Shabbat, you see those people who walk from one place to another. Manishma, how are you? Wow, good to see you. Wow, nice tie. That's what's important now when we pray to Hashem in the middle of the, of the synagogue with the Sefer Torah outside. Nice jacket, Lechaim, Machazaku Baruch. I once went to a synagogue somewhere in New York on Shabbat. First time and last time I was there in my life for Shabbat. I happened to be there. Stayed by someone and that's the shul he chose. There was uh, hundreds of people there on Shabbat. And when they give aliyah to someone, after he comes down from the, from the bima, Maybe 50 people come from all directions. Chazaku baruch, mwah, mwah, chazaku baruch, nishikot, hugging, kissing. The Baal Kore already read another two minutes. You can hear a word. Chazaku baruch, Moshe, Charlie, Yitzchak, chazaku baruch, chazaku baruch. Bruchim to you. I became the Baba Sali. Maybe we should hear a little bit something that Torah has to say. One thing. <laughs> People, Baruch Hashem, are so excited, they went up to the Torah, it's like a big party, no problem. They want to say Chazaku Baruch to 50 people, wait, finish the party, and then continue to read. But this is an example of some mitzvot that we sometimes don't respect enough. I'll give you one more example. Coming to shul on time. How many people actually arrived to the synagogue on Shabbat on time to start Mamash from Birkot HaShachar? How many? Sometimes you have a place, you have a hundred people that comes on Shabbat. When they come to the Kaddish of Odu, there's no Minyan. They start, let's say, 8 o'clock in the morning. 8.15 they arrive to Odu, they have to say Kaddish. They're waiting for the 10th person to come. By 8.40, 8.50, the place will be packed, not one seat available. Why? People come half an hour late. Why? Disrespect. You have a meeting with the president, you come half an hour late. If someone will arrange for your meeting now with a very important person, even a rabbi, a rabbi, I set for you a big, a big meeting with a very important chacham. You have to be there at 8, 8 a.m. Will he come at 8.40? Why? No, it's disrespect. What about Hashem? Not always thinking. This is what the Torah talks about. Rashi. Mitzvot she'adam dash be'akevav. I want to ask you a question. Which mitzvot are more important? The heavy mitzvot of the Torah with the huge reward and the huge punishment? Or the small mitzvot of the Torah with the small reward and the small punishment? Which one are more important? What do you think? You have two stores. One make a million dollar a year, the other one make 50,000 a year. Which store is more important? Nobody knows? No? You're afraid to answer? When it comes to misfortune, huh? it's not like that. By the stores, which store is more important? Which store you want to keep? The one who makes 50,000 a year or the one who makes a million a year? The one that makes a million here. You have mitzvah with a huge reward or a huge punishment if you break it. Compared to a mitzvah that is a small reward and a small punishment. Which one is more important, more critical? 
the one with the huge reward and the huge punishment. If chas v'shalom, you already chose to commit sin, you should go for the small one, not for the big one. It's one big mitzvah with a big punishment can be equal to a thousand small ones, like the Rambam writes. Not all mitzvot are the same weight. However, there is one trick here. Trick. When Hashem will judge us, which mitzvot, God forbid, can actually bury us in a judgment? The big one or the small one? Logically, we just said that one big one can be equal like a thousand small one. True, a hundred percent. But we are going to make excuses why we didn't keep those big important mitzvot. We're going to make excuses. But the excuses will not help us for only one reason. Why they won't help us? Because when Hashem will show us that the small mitzvot that we neglected and we didn't pay enough attention, this will be standing against us in a moment when we're going to make excuses on the other mitzvot. Let me explain. When you come, when Hashem will ask you why you didn't keep this important mitzvah, you're going to say, Hashem, it was hard. You know me, I'm lazy. It's hard for me to do such a thing. As it is, I'm trying very much. I couldn't do it. That's when Hashem will show you a small mitzvah and will say, what about this? This one is also big and heavy. This one is five minutes. Why didn't you do that? Benji, ask them to take him out. What's going on? So, Rabotai, the, the small mitzvot will be the one that Hashem will use chas v'shalom against us when we make excuses that the large mitzvot was too difficult for us. I'll give you an example. If a person does not learn enough Torah on Shabbat, on a weekday, six days a week, he's busy with his store, opening early, closing late, when Hashem, when Hashem will ask him why he didn't learn enough Torah, what will he say? Who would run the business? I didn't have a son to help me. I couldn't afford to hire more people. I was a slave of the business. 6 a.m. I'm already there. 11 o'clock I come home. What kind of life did I have? I had to feed my children. When did I have time to learn? That's when Hashem is going to point on Shabbat. When the business is closed and he finishes chulent and what does he do? jump into bed by 1 a.m. 1 p.m. until 7 p.m. mincha time six hours sleep on Shabbat now Hashem is gonna say okay I understand that in a weekday you were very busy with the store you didn't have a peace of mind to learn unfortunately that's the kind of living you made for yourself but why didn't you set time to learn Torah? Because there was no time, I'm sorry. I just couldn't. Who would take care of the customer? What would I do, close the store? That's when Hashem will bring Shabbat and say, in Shabbat there was no customers. On Shabbat there was no stores. What did you do on Shabbat? Did you open a book? Did you learn? If he learned every minute on Shabbat, that will help him to get a lenient punishment for the rest of the week. Because now he has a case. You see, when I was available, when the store was closed on a Sunday, on Shabbat, on holidays, I, I took advantage on every minute to learn. When the store was open, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to learn. At least you have something to claim. Same thing over here, Rashi said. If it's a big mitzvah and we have an excuse why we didn't keep it, Hashem is going to point on a much easier mitzvah that we knew about and we didn't care. He will use it to prove to us that we have no irat shamayim.
And that's what it means, Vayaikif Tishmeun. The Shla Kadosh, 500 years ago in Tzfat, it says uh, many people are making a very common mistake. They think, I better focus on the important mitzvot of the Torah because one mitzvah equal like a thousand small ones. Just like in deals in real estate. You have a house that you make $5,000 commission on. And you have a house that you can make 100,000 commission. Why should you waste time on a five? It's the same amount of work. Go for the one that you make 100. One like that, it's like 20 small deals. Why should I waste so much time on 20 deals in, when in one deal I can make the same amount? Logical, right? The problem is that when it comes to the Torah, you cannot do this kind of calculation. Because all the small mitzvot adds up to a huge punishment in the end. Little one, and another one, and another one, and another one. You don't care. You don't pay attention. It's not important enough for you. Ah, that's Rabbanan. That's only rabbinical. In the end, it becomes a huge mountain of sins. That can turn everything to the negative side. That's how the parasha started. I, I expect you to pay attention to any mitzvah, whether it's big, whether it's smaller, whether it's more important, whether it's according to your understanding is less important. Either one, you must pay attention to every one of them. We know it's written in the prophet Isaiah, Yeshaya, chapter 11, verse 9. It says like this. Malah aretz dea et Hashem kamaim layam mechasim. There will be time that the earth will be covered, covered with divine wisdom, complete covered with divine wisdom. Just like the ocean covered the land, you don't see the land, it's covered with huge, 72% of the world is covered with water. Go find the, the sand in the bottom of the ocean, it can be miles, that's how deep it is. But, you know, when I, the way when Hashem created the world, it was one side water and one side land. That's it, there was no islands, there was no lakes, no rivers. Besides the Garden of Eden, just we read in Parashat Bereshit, it describes a river that has two heads and it splits, and trees and beautiful fruits and animals, Mamash like a beautiful life. Everything was given to Adam. You are in charge, take care of the trees, take care of everything. This all was made for you. This was all made for you. Ten da'atcha shelo tekalkel et olami. Pay attention that you will not ruin my world. Did Adam keep the uh, watch the warning or no? A minute later he already destroyed the world by eating from the forbidden tree, everything that Hashem had in mind had to change. Now I want to ask you a question. According to the Torah, there was one side water, one side land, one continent. That's it. No seven continents. With one tiny river that goes from X place to a place compared to the size of the world. And the rest of the world was very, very easy. When you look today on the globe, you see 72% is blue, right? It's all water. All the oceans, Atlantic, this, Pacific. And then you have thousands of islands. That's on a map here, a little island here. There's even a country that it's in an island. I forgot their name. How many people have in the, they have in their country? Guess how many? It's the smallest country in the world. How many? 1,800 citizens. That's the country. They have a flag, anthem, government. 
1,800 people. In my block, I think we have more than 1,800 people. Here in Rigo Park, one, two, three buildings, you already have 1,800 people. Or in Manhattan. So, but you have thousands of islands and seven continents. And when you try to find a place which is Garden of Eden, where is it? Good luck finding it. Where is that garden that Hashem put Adam there? Where is it? I already will save you a lot of headache and time. If you search all over the maps and all over the globe, you're not going to find that place, Garden of Eden. You, don't, you won't find it. The reason is very, very simple. The world that Hashem made have changed 1,500 years later. The world was created 5,783 years ago, soon 84, Rosh Hashanah. 5,784 years ago. 4,200 years ago approximately, meaning 1,500 years approximately after the creation of the world, the world was rearranged. When Hashem told Noah, to gather all the animals, two of each, into the ark, which was a very long boat with three floors. And for one year, they had to be there. 40 days of massive rain, floods everywhere. The boat went all the way to the mountains of Ararat, which is Turkey. Turkey! When the water started to evaporate, it was a process. Every week a little less, one inch less, one inch less. The boat eventually landed on a very high mountain in Turkey. It's called Harei Ararat, the mountains of Ararat. Just like it's written in the Torah. That ark was found exactly where the Torah say. The archaeologists, they went to look for that ark and they found it exactly in the right measurement. They found Noah's Ark. Where? In a huge mountain. Why am I telling you that? When you want to make a boat that it's very, very long, size of a football field, and very wide and very tall, it took Noah 120 years to build it on his own. He didn't have the equipment we have today. And Hashem wanted people to see that Noah is building an ark for the horrible day that will come and wipe them all out. But I want to ask you this. When you build a big boat, where usually the factories of the big boats are? Right by the water. That by the time they finish the boat, they move the bottom and it falls right into the water. Because there's no way to carry a boat size of a building or two buildings attached to carry it from where you are to the ocean. You're going to need 20,000 people to push. You need wheels. How are you going to take it? How are you going to carry it up the hill? There's no way to do it. Even with the equipment that we have today, you cannot move a boat even one block. If you want to move a boat in Brooklyn, where are you going to take it? What street? Even if you are in an open area, mountains, how are you going to lift the boat up the mountain, down the mountain, until you get to the water? There's nothing dumber than to make a huge boat far away from the water. You have to make the factory right by the water. Every huge boat that you see in the ocean was created one inch from the water. You got it or not? If that's the case, how did they find such a huge boat in the top of a mountain in Turkey? There's no water there. How did the boat arrive there? Who would make such a boat in the top of a mountain? For what? The answer, of course, no one made it there. Noah made it where he was, and the water started to carry the boat, and higher, and higher, and higher. And then when the water started to dry out, the boat was moving and moving and moving until it touched the ground. Where did he touch the ground? In the mountains of Turkey, there, Ararat, like the Torah described. The flood that we had in the, in the time of Noah, 4,200 years ago, not only there was 40 days of massive rain non-stop, it didn't stop for a minute. 
You know, sometimes we have floods here in New York. A year or two ago, there was such a flood. I remember that night I spoke in Great Neck. On the way back, we almost died. Another foot with the car, we would drown to death. There was a lake in the middle of the highway. You don't see it until the last second. If your car goes into the water in one shot, it shuts the engine, shuts the electric, you cannot open the doors, you cannot open the windows, water cover the car from top to the bottom, and you choke to death. That's how a lot of people die in floods. A lot of people die like that, Loyalin. There's no way to open the door, the, the weight of the water, and if you try to open the window, the water's gonna come in. There's no way to go out. Once you go into the water, you're done. So, when there was a flood in the time of Noah, it wasn't only 40 days of massive rain. The spring water also exploded. There's water under the ground. Sometimes you see the water shoots up. If you dig in a, in a hole in the ground. In Monsi, some houses do not have water from the water company. They have a well. They dug a hole 300 feet in the ground. 300 feet, it's like one and a half blocks. 300 feet, it's long. 300 feet, think about it. Very deep in the ground. And they get water with the pump, free. Water, clean water comes from the bottom. Sometimes there are 30 days with no rain. The well gets dry. That's where the problems begin. Once the well gets dry, it's a big disaster to fix it. But as long as it's raining in New York almost every week, the well, the spring water are full. Spring water came out and broke the continent from one piece into seven. Once the continent broke, it started to move, to shift. Africa, Asia, America, Australia. Everything started to move. Some animals were standing over here and shifted there. Some animals shifted to that continent. Some continents have animals that the other may not have. Of course, in the last 4,200, people took animals in boats from one continent to the other, so today you can find everything everywhere. But one thing you have to know, in, uh, ninth, in uh, 1870, until 1920, 50 years, there was a scientist called Alfred Wagner, not a Jew. Wagner can be Jewish also, but this one was German. He lived 50 years, and he won an award for his discovery. His discovery was, he proved that the seven continents that we have used to be one and he shows which piece detached from what piece. He measured green with green, brown with brown. You see this piece is uh, 30 miles. It was connected to here, 30 miles. Today I saw a place that have houses right by the water. Everyone wants to live by the water. Nice view. But it's very dangerous. Why? Water always makes damage. Just a matter of time. When there's wind, like today, storm outside, waves, it can cause flood in the house, like happened in Seagate. Remember a few years ago? Wiped out Seagate. But even if there's no storm, the water goes under the sand of your house constantly. Just like a mouse that constantly eat and eat and eat, until one day the house fall into the water. Today I saw something like this. The entire land broke with the house and fell into the river. Washed out the whole house. Very dangerous. I'm not talking about the mosquitoes and other problems that it creates. Everything for the view. For the view. Top. Wagner proved that seven continents used to be one, just like the Torah said. That's exactly what the Holy Zohar said 2,000 years ago. Yabeshet achat haita ve'nechleka le'shiva chalakim. 
There was one continent who was divided to seven pieces. The islands are the crumbs. When you take a, a hammer, you have a big board. Board. You want to break it to pieces. When you hit it, it begins to crack and it begins to break to pieces. There's always small pieces. Little piece here, little piece there. Once the explosion occurred, many pieces went and landed here and landed there, an island here, an island there. Slowly, slowly, the world was rearranged. The Garden of Eden is no longer exist. The water washed it out, that's it. The place, the way the Torah described how Hashem created the world, you won't be able to find this place. I think that the reason for it is Ashkelosh Baruch Hu didn't want us to know about it, to, to find this place. After the sin of Adam, it's written in the Torah that Hashem kicked him out from the place. Geresh You don't deserve, I gave you everything and you already rebelled against me. Geresh Oto And told him, Bezat Apecha Tochal Lachem. You have to walk like a slave to bring Parnasa to the house. How many people suffer now from Parnasa? How many, even wealthy people, I get calls from people that own buildings in Manhattan, they are devastated. Why? They took mortgages on a, on a building, it used to be 2%, 3% interest. Building that worth $100 million, you pay $80 million mortgage, every percent is a huge difference. It went up to 7, 7.5%. Some of the tenants don't pay rent from COVID already. So 30% is vacant. Not all apartments or offices are taken. Some of them are empty. So why there you lose 30% income? Plus you pay on a mortgage five times more. You used to pay 1% a year besides the principal, 2%. Now you pay 7%. So one owner told me, I don't know how long I will be able to survive. I put tons of money every month into the building for my own pocket, for my savings. Few more months like that, I will have to give the building to the bank. Take it. Think about it. A person a year ago, two years ago, sitting in his home in a beautiful mansion, driving a Rolls Royce, having a hundred thousand dollars watch, flying in the most expensive flight, living the life, thinking I own a building in Manhattan. The value of the building is 150 million. 50 million of that is mine. Then you own another building and another building. In every building he has 10 million here, 5 million there, 20 million there. He has 200 million dollar asset. The rest is mortgage. All of a sudden, the government of the United States said there's high inflation. Everything goes up every day. Well, what's going on? Everything went up like crazy. We have to raise the interest rate to lower inflation. When you raise the interest rate, people buy less. When people buy less, the owners of the merchandise begin to lower prices. Plus, real estate goes down. When interest rate goes up, real estate goes down. We have to balance the market. So real estate begins to go down. Some people don't pay a mortgage from the time of COVID. And now he has to pay a lot more on a, on a loan. So basically all these buildings was all an illusion. He really doesn't have a penny. This person that drives a Rolls Royce as we speak is more poor than one of my Bachurei Yeshiva in Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. They don't have a penny to their name. But they don't owe millions of dollars. After you give the building now to the bank, the bank with their penalty and legal fees and all the things, they still would want you to pay a few more million dollars. What do you think? They don't leave you alone. You give us the building, we take it to the auction, we're still not going to cover the loan. So that's what's happening right now to a lot of people. A person has 20 buildings. He is now in a need of a million dollars a month to cover all the mortgages. And he can get it, because his mortgage became triple now. That's what the Gemara says, Marbe Nechassim, Marbe Deagot. 
The more assets you have, the more things to worry about you have. The Gemara asks, what's better, to be wealthy, to be poor, or to be average, mediocre, meaning pay your bills, survive, month by month. What's better? Poor, nobody wants to be, so that's out of the picture. Rich, everybody wants to be. Mediocre, only few smart people wants to be. Most of the people do, will not settle to be mediocre. They want to have a lot of money. Why mediocre is better? A person say, I don't want the life that every month I have to worry about next month if I will have enough to pay the bills or not. Even though for 30 years Hashem pay all his bills and he cover all his expenses and every month he makes it, even after 30 years, 30 years, how many months it is? Huh? 360 months. So many months. Already Hashem saved you 360 times. He had enough for the rent, or for the mortgage, enough to feed your children, enough for clothing, enough to pay the yeshivot. 30 years! Still worry what's going to be next month. Still worry. Are you worried that the sun will not rise tomorrow? Why are you not worry? Because every day it happens. But every day Hashem took care of you for 30 years, every day. Still not convincing, who knows why. What's the difference between the sun and the parnasa? One word. Yetzerara, chazaku baruch. The, the Yetzerara doesn't tell you to worry if the sun would rise tomorrow or not. Why? What's in it for me? If there won't be sun, that means the world comes to an end. Everyone will die. So what is the big deal? And if there will be a sun, it's, uh, I take it for granted. My personal parnasa is more important than the sun. That's only it's rara. Maybe next month you won't have. So the Gemara say, mediocre is the best. If you be too poor, chas shalom, you may steal. Why? A religious person that is not a thief and is very poor, has a higher chance to steal or a lower chance to steal? Huh? Religious, Bachur Yeshiva, Avrech, have 13 kids, lives in a tiny apartment in Yerushalayim, pay 12,000 shekel rent. Believe it or not, the prices of Jerusalem is the most expensive now in the world. Houses that were built more than 100 years ago with no elevator. Hundred years ago, the time of the Ottomani, the Turks, the, the Ottoman Empire. See the windows, you see the shape, the architecture. Apartments over there of two bedrooms, they want more than 10,000 shekel a month. When an average worker in Israel makes 6,000 shekel a month. So the rent is almost double than what an average worker makes. I tell you, also, that there's a person in Yerushalayim that uh, has a family and now he has to move out of his apartment and every apartment will not give him any because he doesn't have money for security you know credit credit history doesn't it he wanted someone to sign for him uh, to be a co-signer that someone asked me should i co-sign I say, if you're willing to jeopardize one year of rent of such a place in Jerusalem, you're willing to waive such a loss, sign. If you're not willing to take such a loss, do not sign. So what should I do? Say, I'm gonna give you a gift. Here is a thousand dollars, leave me alone. I'll help you out. Better to give them something than to sign. Sign, you become a prisoner. Even for your own children, you have to think a million times before you co-sign. When you co-sign, all the responsibility is on you. They'll mess up, it's all on you. I have a cousin that his life was destroyed. His life was destroyed because of personal guarantee sign. His life was destroyed. 40 years they collect from him. They never leave you alone in Israel. There's no such thing. 
you owe them money, they will collect from you until the day you die. And if you don't pay, they come to your house, they break in, they, they take your furniture, they freeze your bank account, they don't leave you alone. What you pay every month, you actually, the debt is growing. Let's say you pay $1,000 a month, the interest and the penalty was 3000 So if you owe $100,000 40 years ago, after paying every month, now it's three times more. They never leave you alone. Interest. That's why the Torah was so, so anxious about people to understand that interest is against the law. So, Abutai, the person said to me, but it breaks my heart. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? No one will allow them to rent an apartment. I will hate to see them on the street. The emotions kick in. What would you answer to something like that? Someone say such a thing, what would you answer? No, Elia, what would you say? Huh? Oh, but where are they gonna go? No one will agree to rent for them if I won't co-sign. What's the answer to that? Who said I have to live in the most expensive city in the world? That's what I say. Let them move to a city in some places in Israel, the rent will be a quarter of Jerusalem. Instead of 12,000 shekel a month, it will be 3,500 shekel a month. Religious enough. You have Yerucham, Netivot, you have places a little bit in the south. What do you care? You sit and learn Torah. So you live in a city that is not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is expensive for business people. It's very expensive. Very. Jerusalem, Baruch Hashem, like the prophecy, became today the most expensive city in the world, officially. The most expensive, there's no, nothing to compare, not even Manhattan. Very expensive. People buy tiny apartments in the new buildings that they build in the center of Jerusalem, more than a million and a half dollar, tiny apartment, tiny, tiny, like studio apartment, million and a half dollars. And every month it grows up, higher and higher and higher. There are houses in Yerushalayim that are worth 30, 40 million dollars. Hard to believe. Some neighborhoods are very expensive. There's some out of all too, right? There's some out of all property in Yerushalayim. Yeah. Some people got lucky. They bought property in Yerushalayim 40 years ago and it was still very cheap. Now, Baruch Hashem, they see the results of their investment. So Rabotai, we're going back to Noah. So everything became now seven continents. Seven continents. And from that moment on, everything in the world is, is never going to be the same. The weather used to be perfect until the time of Noah. Now, one day it's cold, one day it's hot, one day it's freezing, snow, hot, humid. The, the, the weather in the world before the flood was perfect every day. There's no such thing, freezing, sweating, choking, you wouldn't need air condition, you wouldn't need heat. As the curse that the world got after Hashem wiped out millions of wicked people and restarted the world in the time of Noah, things will never be the same. Here is an example about I, or what we are talking here about. So now we have to ask a question. The Navi, the prophet say, there will be times when Mashiach come, that the land will be covered with, with divine wisdom, just like the water covered the land. That's how we got into the explanation of how Hashem made the world. The Gemara, say something very strange. 
Allegedly. When you hear it for the first time, it sounds very strange. La'atid lavo, one time, the mitzvot, the, the, the commandments of Hashem, will not be in the same power like they are now. Meaning their significance will be lower. Different Gemara say that the Torah e never ever will change. Not even one letter from the Torah. Now one mitzvah from the Torah will ever change. That's the divine perfect book of Hashem. One of the third in principle of Judaism is that this Torah will never be changed. How do we deal with this contradiction? In one place it says the Torah will never ever be changed. Over here they said that the mitzvot betelot, meaning they're going to lose their significance. They won't be as a, in, a, in effect like they are today. Can it be? How can it be? The Rambam writes in the end of Ilchot Melachim, the last page, when he described the salvation in the Mashiach, Olam keminagon oed, the world will, will, will remain the same. Everything will still be the same, we'll still put filin, we'll still daven. Later Hashem will eliminate the Yetzirara, the Satan, all the wicked people will be wiped out and the world will be purified and we will finally get to the situation of Letaken Olam Bemalchut Shaddai That only righteous Jews and only righteous Gentiles will remain Now one wicked person can survive Once Hashem clean all the wicked people from the world There's no more Yetzirara, nobody, nobody has to be born again there's no more reincarnation, there's no more judgment, none of that. What do you need it for? What about sacrifices? Will you still need to bring a sacrifice or no? To Bet HaMikdash? Many of the sacrifices is as a result of sins. If it's not going to be a Yetzer Hara, will we need to bring uh, sacrifices? The answer is yes. Not all, some. Donation. Korban Toda, we want to say thank you. You're welcome, bring. Korban Chatat. Korban Chatat is for not intentional sin. Right now, if a person broke Shabbat not knowing, it's not allowed. He had a drop of wine on his tie, quickly took a towel, made it wet, and cleaned the tie. He never heard that you're not allowed to do laundry on Shabbat. He never heard. He takes the towel and he cleans the stain from his shirt or tie, whatever it is. Someone just came and said, what are you doing? It's Shabbat. It's one of the 39 restrictions. You're not allowed to do laundry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. If there was Bet HaMikdash now, he had to bring a sheep to Bet HaMikdash, Korban Chatat. Unintentional sins do not require Yetzer Hara to violate them. It doesn't come from desire or yetzerara. It's just a lack of knowledge. He didn't know it's not allowed. If he knows it's not allowed, now he has yetzerara to do it. But if in his eyes there's nothing wrong with what he does, he didn't even have any desire to go and break the law. When Mashiach would come, everyone will be knowledgeable. Everyone will know the whole Torah, not right away. So what happens if a person just, we have a Bet HaMikdash now, and a person broke Shabbat. And a Chacham will tell him, oh, you just broke Shabbat. Why? You cut the grass by mistake. You spill water on the grass. Look, you're just giving water to the plants. It's not allowed on Shabbat. You push the seed in the ground. Not allowed on Shabbat. You cut your nails. You didn't know. Not allowed on Shabbat. Or your hair. So since you didn't know, obviously you didn't do it because you want to break Shabbat. If you were Mechalel Shabbat, you would never survive. The fact that you survive means you're not committing any sins intentionally. But even though you survive and it's only righteous people, you can still make mistakes. Sometimes you do something forgetting it's Shabbat. How many times it happens, you come out of the bathroom and you turn on or off the light. And wow, Shabbat, by instinct, you shut the light. That's why they have special uh, covers, plastic or whatever. Some people put tape 
to remind themselves that it's Shabbat, because by instincts you may touch something. So this is an example of things that will happen in the time of Beta Mikdash. So now we have to understand this Gemara. Let's try to understand. It's written in the last parasha, Parashat Vayet Hanan. It's written, Asher Anochi Metzavecha Ayom Lasotam. That I am commanding you today to do. Not just to know, to do. What does it mean? Today, Hashem said, you need my command. You need my orders. You need my instruction in order for it to become a mitzvah. What does it mean, mitzvah? Mitzvah comes from the word tzivui. Tzivui, metzave. Metzave, I command you. Ani metzave otcha, latzet achutza. I command you to go out. You must do it. I'm the boss here. Get out. That's called mitzvah. Ani metzave otcha to do this. I metzave otcha not to do that. Metzave is the person that gives the instruction, the command, which is Hashem in this case. The person that received the command is Metzuve, received the Tzivui. The Mitzvah is a Tzivui, the order called Tzivui. What do we say when we make a bracha? Baruch Ata Hashem, bless you God. Elokeinu, our God, our Master, Melech HaOlam, the King of the world, Right? Asher kideshanu bemitzvotav that sanctify us with his commandments. Asher kideshanu bemitzvotav vetzivanu and command us to do such and such. Laniach tefillin. Al achilat matza, al kviat mezuzah, lamul lachniso bebrito shel Avraham Avinu. All of this, Asher. Kiddeshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu that sanctify us how a person become holy by keeping the commandments. When you listen to the creator of the world who command you to do, every time you follow his instruction, you receive more holiness from him. It's like connecting a phone to the charger. Right away it begins to go up. You disconnect, it goes down. Connect, it goes up. How you connect to Hashem? Torah and mitzvot, that's it. Now, Rabotai, Hashem say, when there is a Yetzer Hara and you're not in the mood to do, that's why I command you, I give you an order. The order should make you scared enough to do it, even though it's not so easy for you. But Latid Lavo, after I will slaughter the Satan, and there is not going to be any more evil inclination, the commandments will be in a different channel. You will not need any more to do it because I commanded you. It will be an ultimate, obvious truth to you that I cannot live a second without it. Right now, I have to wake up early and come to shul and pray. Why I do it? I have to do it. It's one of the mitzvot. To daven to Hashem. Put talit, put filin, answer kedusha, birkat kohanim. There's few mitzvot from the Torah every morning. When Mashiach, when Mashiach come and I don't have any more desire, no more laziness, no more ego, no more anger, no more selfishness, no more ungratefulness, Unlimited love to Hashem, perfect understanding, clear understanding in every detail in the world. No more limitation like we have right now, we don't understand basically anything. The value of the mitzvot will be a billion times better, bigger than now. Now I have to push myself to do it. Wow, I'm tired, I slept late, oh my God, 6.30 to wake up, it's not easy. It won't be such thing. It would be a situation I cannot live a second without it. I cannot, when I put feeling, I'll be dancing, crying out of happiness. Because right now we don't understand 1% of the secrets of everything. We don't know, we cannot connect the whole thing. Everything will become so clear. The, this, the, 
the blueprint of the entire creation. It's all based on the 613 commandments. Once you will know the secrets of every mitzvah, the Mashiach will teach the world. There's not going to be any more forgetfulness, no limitation of memory, no difficulty, physical difficulty to come to learn Torah. That's what the Navi say. The divine wisdom will cover the world. You'll be flooded in it, in the greatness of God. So therefore, it's not going to be, oh my God, again to do it. Oof, again to give tzedakah. Oof, again to bake matzot. Wow, one week not to eat bread. None of that would be exist. Oh my God, I cannot say, Lashon Ara, Lashon Ara. He's dying to talk. Right now, he's dying to talk, but he doesn't speak because he's afraid of the punishment or the outcome of his Lashon Ara. Once Mashiach came, there's not going to be such thing. I'm afraid to talk Lashon Ara. I have to shut myself like this not to talk because I'm afraid what Hashem is going to say. No. It's going to be a whole different league, different channel of, of Torah and Mitzvot. That's what it means in the Gemara, that the Mitzvot will be so much more significant and clear in a much higher level of understanding that you won't need the part of the command. You don't need it. Even if you tell me now, you don't have to keep anything. I won't be able to live a second without it. Try to imagine such a world. Try to imagine your life without Yetzer without resistance. Every one of the commandments, you are fully addicted to it. Like the drug addict who cannot live an hour without the drugs. He can, he can live without it. He cannot live a minute without Torah. You cannot go a day without putting tefillin and you're crying and dancing and you're so happy when you put the tefillin on your brain and on your heart. And when you do all these things that the Torah commands, and you, you feel like you're already in heaven. Because everything makes so, you see the, the effect of it. Right now when we are in a physical body full of desires, we don't see. May, very few people feel holiness today. Very few. If you want to be holy, do you know what the list of requirements you have? On my way here, I got a, a, a question from a girl. Don't know who she is. She sent me a question. I was suggested a shiduch with a religious guy. Is it a problem to date someone that has Facebook and Instagram? That's what she asked. Now, I do not know how religious is this girl. The fact that she asked me this question shows that you have some level. Because there's some modern girl that don't even think that there's anything wrong with having this. That kind of girl don't ask a rabbi, should I date a guy that has Instagram or not? At least this girl has some kind of understanding about the horrific damage that these things make to the soul. So the question now is, I send, her a, I send her an answer. I send her, would you agree to date a guy that go to a mixed beach, boys and girls over there all walk without clothes, whatever. Every week he goes to a mixed beach. Would you date someone like that? Religious, Shomer Shabbat, eating kosher. Maybe even learn half an hour to ride a day. But goes to a mixed beach. Tel Aviv, walking there with all the naked people, with all the wicked people around. Would you want a husband like this? If you would, then you can marry someone with Instagram or Facebook. If you wouldn't, then obviously it's not allowed. Why? What's over there in the internet? Mixed speech. What kind of pictures there are there? What kind of videos there are there? People in three days over there destroyed seven years of holiness. Three days? I don't know how it... Three minutes! Not three days. Three minutes! The Gemara say, if you say one curse out of your mouth, a dirty word, you lose 70 years of build-up holiness. You don't lose the mitzvot of Torah. Seven years you learn Torah, whatever you learn is already wired to your next world. Nobody can take it away from you. The only way to lose it 
If God forbid you will say, I regret that I learned Torah all these years. If you say such thing, you lost everything. It's called Toheh al Arishonot. By the way, that's one of the reasons why Akadosh Baruch Hu does not pay the reward in this world. The, we have a halacha in the Torah, Beyomot iten scharo. You have to pay your workers in the day that they finish the job. If you agree with them that you pay them daily, I don't know, $200 a day, and he works until 6 p.m., at 6 p.m. you have to have his money ready. Unless you agree with him that you pay him in the end of the job. Once he finishes the job, you have to pay him. You cannot tell him, come back next week. Right now I'm a little bit tight. You're tight, you don't have permission to start the job. You ask how much the job is, he tells you the price. You have enough money assigned for it, let him work. You don't have, don't make him start working. Why? You're going to break the rules of the Torah. You have to pay him as agreed. If he, he, he waited for you and you didn't come, and he left, every second that passed until tomorrow, you have a sin from the Torah. Every second. It's so severe that there's a question in Halakha, what happens if you accept Shabbat an hour earlier? Shabbat starts at 8, 8.15, let's say, like now. And at 7 o'clock, you go already and do Kabbalat Shabbat. Some people accept Shabbat an hour earlier. After you finish Tfilat Arvit, you're on the way home to do Kiddush and Saudat Shabbat. It's now 10 minutes to 8. You're about to start the meal. It's still, it's still daylight. Some people are going for Mincha now. For you, it's Shabbat already. That's it. You accepted Shabbat. You walk back from the shul, and you just remember now that you didn't pay your worker his daily salary or his weekly salary. You were supposed to pay him at 5 p.m. in a store. When you got to the store to close, he already left. He waited for you. It was 5.30. You locked the gate. You went home. You took a shower, mikveh, everything. You went to the shul. Whoa! I didn't pay my worker his weekly salary. The agreement is you have to pay him before Shabbat. What, what, what are we going to do now? On one hand, I'm not allowed to touch money, I accepted Shabbat. I cannot make phone calls, I cannot drive with a car. For me, it's Shabbat. For the world, it's not Shabbat yet, it's still light outside. But I accepted Shabbat. If I will get into the car now and drive, is this a violation from the Torah or rabbinical? Do you hear the question or no? Someone had accepted Shabbat. And he comes home to start the meal, he's about to do Kiddush, and he remembered that he forgot some emergency. But it's not sunset yet. Shabbat starts in 20 minutes. For him it's Shabbat, for the neighbors, for the people it's not Shabbat. What is he gonna do? The answer, he has to get either a goy or one of the Jewish neighbors that did not accept Shabbat yet give them immediate instructions to fix the problem. For instance, since he owed money to that worker and the worker went home disappointed he didn't get paid, call my worker immediately. What's his number? O open my phone, here is this, his name is such and such, die. The worker picks up the phone, Shalom, I am, I'm the neighbor of your boss. He told me that he forgot to give you the money he wants me now to come and pay you the money. Where are you? Where can I meet you? It's 20 minutes for Shabbat, I must give you the money. If the worker say, ah, no big deal, he can give it to me Sunday. I'm Ochel, I forgive. I forgive him. Then you have no problem. He just forgave you, he gave you an extension. If he say, oh, wow, I'm so glad you called, I really need that money. I really need that money. You must find him and pay him. If you don't pay him every second until Sunday, it's a sin from the Torah. Every second that you're holding his paycheck. Many people don't know it. They play games. They don't pay the creditors. They keep them 90 days, 60 days. If they agree in advance, they agree. But if they didn't agree, some people, they have a trick of forcing you to give them a loan.
You know these uh, sneaky people? I have a guy like this. Every time I need to send money to Israel, to the Avrechim, he has a nice trick. I said to him, okay, listen, you have money in Israel, I need you to give money to my guys in Yeshiva. Okay, no problem. He comes to me, I give him the money, give this, this telephone number, call the Yeshiva, meet him over there. A week, ten days, what happened? Hey, no, no, no. I didn't give you a loan. There was an exchange. I give you the money here, you have to give it right away there. You arrive tomorrow, you give it. Hey, no, I wasn't there, I wasn't your... Why? Him. Wheeler dealer. That's not allowed. It's against the Torah to do things like this. If you say in advance, you give me now the money, I'll give you the money in a week. Can you give me a few days? Okay. If you agree, you agree. But to force a person to give you a loan, it's, it's forbidden. Even to say to a person, can I use your phone? Today, phone calls don't cost money. You pay monthly and that's it. But there used to be days that one phone call with a cellular phone, 25 years ago, used to cost 60 cents per minute. 60 cents was like three dollars today. I remember I was, I'm one of the first people in America that have a cell phone, huge. They installed it in my lousy car. If you remember the story I once said, the owner of the bank, he told me, listen, I'm trying to reach you. I'm tired of this beeper. What a beeper used to be, they sent someone a beep. The beeper beep, two, 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 to see a number. That's it, you have to go to a pay phone get quarters, put quarters, call the office. It was a nightmare. Until you find a pay phone. And usually the pay phone in New York don't work. So this one doesn't work. You have to look for another pay phone. There was no GPS. Sometimes it would take an hour until you return a phone call. He told me, I want you to go to Astoria, Queens Boulevard over there. There is a cell phone place. I want them to install a cell phone on your, in your car. Cell phone installation was $2,200. It was big, massive, heavy, with a stick. They drill it into the bottom of the car. When I went to the place, he, he had a big BMW, huge, like, you know, fancy. Me, I just started my first year in the bank. I had a little tiny car. The name of it was Dodge Colt. I don't even know if they make this car. Garbage of the garbage. <laughs> when I arrived to the store, I saw all these black guys that work there, they all gathered together. Hey, Joe, hey, Joe, come here, you have to see this. All of them came and you know, <laughs> they don't care, they start laughing in my face. <laughs> Man, you want us to install a cell phone in this, this piece of, you know what? I said, just install, come on, you gotta be serious, the phone costs more than a car. The car worth $700. The cell phone was $2,200. In a minute, each minute was 60 cents. Imagine a minute, three, three dollars a minute today. Imagine, you make a phone call, speak five minutes, $15. That's how expensive it was. Today, all month you pay $30, unlimited, this, that. That's how it was. Some people had a satellite phone that you take it with you, 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 you charge it. It's mamash like in a field, you're not in the army. And, and everyone was so excited that, ma, you have a phone in your car. <laughs> Until they saw the car. So imagine now each minute costs you a few dollars. And you come to a person, I'm using your phone, okay? in front of people. What is he going to say? No, it's expensive. What do you mean use my phone? It's going to make him look cheap. So out of the shame, he says, yeah, sure, sure. And his heart is burning. That's pure stealing from the Torah. That's considered stealing. If you put a person in a spot, taking advantage on the fact that he will be embarrassed to say no, that's against the Torah to do such thing. That's why I know some Talmidei Chachamim Sometimes they ask someone to call someone and speak to them. I say, Rabbi, if you call, you will agree immediately. So that's the reason I don't call. If I will call, 
he will be embarrassed to tell me no. But how do I know? Maybe he doesn't do it with a full heart. To you, he won't be embarrassed to say no. You tell him I need a favor, ask him if he's willing to do it. If he'll say no to you, he didn't say no to me. To me, he will say yes for sure. But I don't want to force him to do something against his will. Bottom line, Rabotai, when it comes to Midot, there is a lot to learn. Many, many years you have to learn until you become a decent human being. There are things that you don't even think about, how to behave in a table, in a meal. Unbelievable. So, Rabotai, going back to what the Prophet says, Hashem said to us, when you have Yetzirah, you need me to commend you and to give you a reward and to give you punishment and to urge you and to push you and to warn you and to repeat it and to send you prophets to wake you up. All of that is needed for one reason. Because you have strong resistance, you have strong Yetzirah, evil inclination, and you have almost zero understanding how my world works. You don't see the effect of the mitzvot. If a person wants to be holy, do you know how many things he needs to do in his life? Let me give you a, a short summary, how you become holy. First, you watch your eyes completely. You don't look at people, not even men. You don't look at wicked people at all. You try to come in contact with as less possible people. Just when I really must. You dedicate your entire life for Torah. You daven from a broken heart with full devotion. Mikveh every day. You watch your mouth perfectly. Now one word that is not necessary. Only words of Torah. You purify your mind. You do not have any social media. You don't have access to any screen. You don't look at any screens on the street. You don't go to any not kosher wedding or bar mitzvah or any mixture of men and women. You don't go to any malls. You don't walk on the street of filthy cities like Tel Aviv or Manhattan or other places when everyone behaves like animals in the street and don't dress. There is a lot of requirements. I know few people that live in these standards. These people feel the holiness of the mitzvot to a very high level. And best example is Rabbi Yaakov Ades. We, in order for us to cry about how horrible is our situation, Maybe, maybe we are able to do it the last hour of Yom Kippur, Tfilat Neila. When you know you must cry before it's going to be too late and the entire year will go down the drain. And the words of the prayers are so emotional that you cannot leave your eyes dry. But how many hours like this we break our heart with tshuva and tears? One, two hours a year. Why? Because we're deep in the mud, in a spiritual mud. We're deep in the mud. We cover, our neshama is covered with a lot of layers of impurity. It's called in the Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah, klipot, peels, shells. It blocks the divine light of Hashem from our soul. Remember, the soul is apart from Hashem. So the soul is very, very attracted to the big light of Hashem. The problem is when you cover the soul with one layer and another layer and another layer, the light does not penetrate. When you do tshuva, when you go to the mikveh, when you learn Torah, those layers begin to fall off. Every layer that falls off, you begin to feel more and more the presence of the divine light. As we, le as we learn here in a series, Way of Hashem, we just did it a few weeks ago here. That's a very recommended series to understand how the holiness of the world works. So, Rabbi Yaakov Ades, every day, 
every tiny praise, it's full of crying and screaming. Attachment to the light of Hashem in the highest level that possible in this generation. He lay on the floor, he lay like this on the floor in a hotel for hours. Not on Tisha B'Av. Every day. Every day of his life like this. What does he do in his day? Only learn Torah, pray with tears, scream to Hashem all day, and nothing else. Nothing else. Eat very little, dress the most simple way, make of course every day, has a little room by the hotel. That's why when you speak to him, you faint. What a brain he has. The memory that he has, it's not human. Every line he remembers in every book. Every line. It's not human. You don't have people like this in the world. From the level of holiness that he lives in, everything he learns he remembers. And when he speaks, you see how he always moves. His neshama is shake, he cannot stand. There's no way to see him standing without moving. Pa impossible. Go to the kotel, see. Watch him. He moves, the neshama moves non-stop. Full of holiness, fire inside. You ask him, Rabbi, one minute stand without moving. Not possible. He wrote many, many books in deep Kabbalah. Kabbalah. 2,000 pages each book. No one in the world understands it. No one. The biggest Kabbalist, the openness. This person is not a human. That's what happens when you live in the highest level of holiness, like the Torah says. Why did Hashem give us few people like this in a generation? Him, Rav Dov Kuk from Tveria. Few people. There's one like, the, one like this in Monsi. You can come and see him. Rav Mordechai Steiner. Shlita. You have to see how he cry when he, when he down. How he runs in the synagogue. These people are attached to the Shekhinah. These, these are people. Rav Mordechai Steiner. I used to have a Hasid that used to do my shipping a few years ago. He told me that his father was with him in the same class. And his father told him that he was already like this in, it, in his bar mitzvah. It's probably in his 70s now. When he was bar mitzvah, he would pray, screaming and crying and running back and forth. How many bar mitzvah kids like this you have today in the world? That cry when they daven, shachrit. Very, very pure neshamot. How you become a pure neshama? What is hocus pocus? Press a button. It's years of hard work. Rabotai, it's worth it to be tzaddik, just to be in those days that you finally see all the depth of the mitzvot and how it's all connected. You know, there was one very holy rabbi, his name was Rav Yecheskel Avramsky Zatzal. He lived in Russia in the time of the communist wicked regime. At that time, the government of Russia collected all the rabbis and sent them to the frozen Siberia, which he is hell on earth. Siberia. 50 below zero. A nightmare. Camp, working camp. Rav Amramsky was the only rabbi that somehow got away with that decree. He did not go to Siberia. How did it happen? Thanks to his wife. His wife was a very talented, clever woman. Very clever. She did all kinds of tricks to keep him away from going to Siberia with, with, the, with, the, with the Russian regime. One time she found out that some police officers are on the way to her trying to find out where her husband is. She hid him in an attic under certain things. When the communists arrive, they say, where's your husband? She said, I also want to know. 
He doesn't even care about me. What kind of a husband is this? I'm here already for a week, he doesn't come, doesn't care. All day he hides himself somewhere, whatever, whatever he does. If you find him, please tell him I'm waiting for him a week already. I barely have what to eat. <laughs> now these Russian fools, they come. The woman is screaming, what kind of a husband is this? One week he left me, he doesn't even come. He doesn't look at me. <laughs> she put a very good show. The Rishayim con were convinced that it's true. They left. Few more weeks, he had a peace of mind to sit and learn and hide. One time he came back from the shul, from the bedding. He was a judge in a bedding. There was a Din Torah. He ruled the verdict of the Din Torah was against a very big Posek. The Posek said one thing and he ruled against him. When he came to his library, he was about to pull out a book and a different book fell on the floor. He bent down to pick up the book and he saw that the book that fell is the book of that rabbi that he just contradicted an hour ago. He looked at his wife and he said to her, from this moment on, the day of mercy are over for me. Probably today they will come to take me to Siberia. He said, oh, God forbid, why are you saying that? He said, none of your tricks will help this time. Why? Because I contradicted that Chacham and I came to pull out the book and his book fell on the floor. I know Hashem sending me a sign and I should have not done what I did. And the price will be that today they will take me to Siberia. An hour later they knocked on his door. The story that happened with Aram Ramsky. When they came to that door, they bang on the door, they put him on a train directly to Siberia. When he came to Siberia, it was minus 50 degrees. And what job they gave him? He has to make necklaces of fish. You know, they catch fish, they make a hole in the, in the ice. They catch the fish. How they gonna bring the fish? They have a special nail with a string. They stick the nail in the fish, pull it from the other side and another fish, and another fish, they make a whole necklace with small fish, they tie it, and they bring it like that. 20 fish in one uh, necklace. That was his job. The problem was that you have to break the ice, and your, uh, your hands become frozen. You don't feel, you're numb already. It's yellow. You have to keep putting your, to catch the fish. It's a disaster. And then when you take the fish out, the fish stay frozen. Why? Because it's very cold, the water cold. So, then you have to go nine feet sometimes to catch the fish. Inside, with the, with the, with, with, you know, the inside the hole. So it was a disaster. In minus 50 degrees, wind in the face. You cannot wear gloves because you can't put it in the water. And you cannot you cannot make the necklaces with the gloves. So the mamash was a terrible job. One time in the middle, he fell asleep. He was already so exhausted, he fell asleep in the middle of work. And he saw his father-in-law came to him in a dream. In the middle of while he was working. His father-in-law came with a very, very holy man. Look, very, very special image. Hamiv said to him, his father-in-law said to him, he said to the holy man, look how my son-in-law suffered, poor guy. Misken. And the holy man said, yes, next time he should learn how to pay respect to bigger rabbis than him. Who was this man? The rabbi from the book that fell on the floor. The father-in-law say, have mercy on him. He suffered enough for that, don't you think? Plus, he didn't rule from his mind. He ruled like other poskim. It's not that he have anything against you. 
He said, אני מוחל לו, I forgive him. He woke up, immediately after, a few minutes, a messenger showed up, said, you have to come with me. He took him to an office in a camp, and the officer over there said, you finish with your fish, from now your job is to distribute bread, add bread. Nice, comes out in a freezing 50 degrees, you hold the bread, it's warm. That's like winning the lottery. First you can eat, you know, you can eat, when they don't see you eat a little bit, you're walking by the bakery. And you don't freeze, in the bakery it's warm. That's much like winning the lottery. And he was there until international pressure on the communist Russia was building up, and in the end they released them from the camp. And then, you know, it's one of the legendary Chachamim. What is the moral of the story? There are two ways to look at life. One is all random, coincidence, bad luck, why me? Which is all wrong. The other way is, what have I done to deserve it? Meaning, I deserve it for sure. It's not a question if I deserve it or not. The question is why I deserve it. You got sick, your back hurts, your teeth hurts. You cannot fall asleep for a few days already. Hashem, help me out here. What, what is the message? Someone insulted you, someone cursed you on the street, someone banged into your car, someone cut you on the road. Every little thing is a slap from Shammai. You lose money, you find money. The guy say to you something, he curses you, he curses your wife, curses your children. Every little thing is from Shamayim. Every little thing is from Shamayim. The problem is that today people don't pay attention. In their life it's like robot. Sick doctors, sick emergency room, sick hospital. Mayim lefashfesh b'maasav. Every physical sickness has a spiritual root, spiritual reason. The Gemara says, Have you have migraines, headache? Open the Gemara and start learning. What is the benefits of learning when your head is pounding? Two benefits. When you learn Torah, you already find a huge favor in the eyes of Hashem. So it brings mercy on you. Kol alomet Torah balayla, chud shel chesed mashuk halav kol alayla. Someone who stay up all night and learn Torah, there is a line of kindness and mercy come from the court of heaven on his head. When you learn Torah, you cannot die. The Torah magna and matzla. But there is another advantage. When your brain begins to think about the difficulty of the Gemara, he stops sending pain for the reasons that he sends you migraines. Why? Because remember, the brain is like another human being inside you. He is the chief of command. He distributes according to what he thinks is urgent. If you have back pain, because the brain got false information that you picked up something heavy and you saw a few days ago, you saw someone pick up something heavy and he pulled the muscle and for three days he is in bed. The brain now is in panic mode. The next time when you lift something heavy, boom, is in panic mode before something will go wrong. But that's false alarm. There's really no reason to send pain. If someone will kick you in the knee, boom, very hard. The knee will hurt very much. Once the, the pain in the knee begins, the pain in the back is gone. Now the brain has something else to focus on. If now there, are, there is a difficulty to understand the Gemara, the brain has to put all the efforts to understand the Gemara, he neglect the pain, the pain. Same thing when you learn Gemara, you don't think about your mortgage that is due tomorrow. You don't think about the accident, your car is waiting, waiting to be told. You don't think about the sickness of one of your child, Lo Alenu. You don't think about the government case against you. None of it exists. 
Why? Because the brain is focused on the Gemara, therefore all the problems in the world doesn't exist. For how long? As long as you learn. Once you finish, everything comes back in one shot. Close the Gemara, one day, lunch time. What's the first thing happen? You come out of the yeshiva, ooh, I have the car. Ooh, I have a doctor's appointment. Ooh, I have this. Ooh, I have that. When you learn, none of that bothers you. So what do you see? That all the worry, all the stress, it's really not necessary. There is a way to be right now without it. When? When I'm happy, I learn Torah. Pikudei Hashem Yesharim Esamchei Lev. Pikudei, the commands of Hashem are straight, not crooked. Pikudei Hashem Yesharim Mesamchei Lev. Make the heart happy. Much more than alcohol and drugs and the rest of the, the, the comedy. That's all fake laugh. Mesamchim talem makes the heart happy. Mitzvat Hashem bara meirat enayim. The mitzvot of Hashem are crystal clear. Enlight the eyes. Meirat enayim. You see the world in a different way. You're more optimistic, you're more happy. You have more confidence, less fear. Doesn't break your spirit. Life with the Muna and life without the Muna is heaven and hell. That's why I always tell people that always cry about the situation. There is only one remedy to you. Learn four hours a day about confidence in Hashem. Okay, Rabbi, where should I start? It's very good books about it. Oh, I'm not the type to learn to read books. I don't have patience. Who has patience to read today, Rabbi? Okay, go to my lecture. I have uh, maybe 15 lectures about it. Faith, confidence in Hashem. Bitachon be Hashem. Emunah lectures. You know, how each lecture is two hours and up. You know how much knowledge you have over there? It's going to make you very strong. Once your emunah is threatened, becomes better and better every day, you begin to laugh at the things you cried a week ago. To laugh, literally. <laughs> Can't believe I was worried about this. That's the way of the Satan, to make you sad. Once you said, Hashem is stepping away from you. The person that he said, the Shekhinah cannot come to him. That's why when King Saul was upset and sad, immediately he called David Amelech to play music for him to return to him the happiness and the peace of mind. Why? Because once I'm sad, I know Hashem is away from me. Also, when you are attached to a wicked person, Hashem also leaves you. Make sure not to be affiliated with wicked people, as less as possible. Don't interact with them, don't invite them, don't sit in a restaurant to eat with them. Don't go to their parties. Stay away from this kind of people. They will only bring you problems in life. Now one positive thing will come out of them. Clowns, people with dirty mouths, mechalelei Shabbat, gays, people that hate religion, ungrateful people to God. Stay away from this kind of liberal, wicked people. Eh, but it's my uncle, it's my aunt. As less as possible. Don't offend people, don't insult people, don't fight with people, don't put them down, that's also not good. Slowly, slowly evaporate. Stay away. What happens you have wicked parents? Move far away from them. Far away. Why? Once here they come, you take the, the damage. They make very big damage to your children. What do you think? Most kids get off the way because of the closest people. Neighbors, friends, grandparents. How many grandparents the, the, the mother put the kids by the grandma or by the grandfather? And what do they see over there? TV, radio, dirty world, fighting, cursing, eating without bracha. It penetrates to the subconscious. 
Not to talk about some grandparents who come with a car on Shabbat. You look at your own grandparents, they're driving a car on Shabbat, they're walking in with a phone, with a car key, putting it on the Shabbos table. Who say it's good? Oh, well, my family! Family! Family will not save you in the day of trial. What are you going to say to Hashem? Oh, what can I do? I have to respect my parents. Not on the expense of murdering your children's soul. I know a case of a boy and a girl that became Baalei Tshuva. It's, the story is over 20 years ago. Very righteous people. The boy and the girl. Mamash great shidu. Very spiritual man. Very spiritual girl. Got married. They have already a child or two at that time. And the girl had a mother that was extremely wicked. Extremely weak, and it cannot be worse than her. On purpose, she comes dressed not modest. She's cursing, she's screaming, she's violent. She wants everyone to bow down to her. Horrible, arrogant person. You're gonna put your kids with me, and I'm gonna feed them whatever I want, and you're not gonna tell me what to do in my house. So I told them, you gotta stay away from her, move to a place, change your phone number, make sure she never ever knows where you are. She wanted to murder me, this woman. Oof, what threats I got, I used to get. I'll send you people, or kill you, this, that. Non-stop for years, she was cursing me in Brooklyn, non-stop. What's the results of my advice? The guy is a great rabbi, as I, if I'm not mistaken, seven or eight kids, all of them Talmidei Chachamim, in yeshivot, beautiful home. Ten neshamot, close to ten neshamot, maybe nine, are now making Hashem happy every second in the world. Thanks for taking them away from that wicked monster that will destroy every one of them, guaranteed. Every one of them, of these kids. Now, most parents are not like that. They're just not knowledgeable. What can they do? They're not Shumer Shara. They grew up in Bukhara, Russia, communist places. They never had a chance to learn Torah. We're not judging them. We're not even blaming them. Some of them give respect. When they see Rabbi, they give respect. They just don't know. So what are we going to do? What can we do? The life of our children comes before everything. There's no time for emotions here. It's a, it's lo ta'amod al dam recha. You have a, you have a big responsibility. Hashem gave you children. One mistake can destroy their soul. Not two. One. One time you take them for Passover in a hotel somewhere in Miami, and your kids will never be the same. One one holiday in a hotel. It's the end of you. Do you know what they're going to see over there in Miami or there around the pool or by the lobby? I one time went to a wedding in Miami. Told me it's going to be in a hotel. We're going to have our own section. The meal is going to be there, Shabbat, everything. And then Sunday will be the wedding. I thought to myself, okay, good. I'm not going to walk in the streets of the filthy place of Miami. I'll be from the room to the dining room to the shul. Couldn't come out of the room. Cannot come out of the elevator. Know what's happening over there? You have to close your eyes like this and try to find a way. Nobody, nobody there has a human being image. People are much worse than animals. Animals walk naked on the street. They're not embarrassed. You don't understand what's happening there. Religious Jews leaving places here with good communities and moving over there. What's going to happen with their children? We will see in 10 years. Let them now make fun and think, ah, the weather, the weather. The weather. The weather in hell, the weather is a lot harder. The weather. That's the main answer. I love it here. The weather. What, is that? what kind of a stupid answer is this? Put, put the heat, put air condition. What do I know? Make sure that you survive the weather. The weather is a reason to take your place to a place with no nothing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what's happening here. I want to finish, Rabotai, 
with the, one of the most important psukim, in my opinion, that everyone will have to know by heart, and at least once a day to remember it. There is a verse in the parasha, Ve'ata Israel, and now Israel. It's an announcement. Ma Hashem Elokecha Shoel Mi'imach. What is your God asking from you? What am I asking from you? Ki'im, only one thing. One thing. Ki'im, ki'im means only one thing. Le'ira et Hashem Elokecha, to fear your God. To fear your God. It's not your friends from high school. It's not your neighbor that you sit and make fun and watch a show together. Creator of the world is coming to review how you behave. You have to shake. Abba, I don't like the fear. Who cares what you like? There is a world and the world has rules. And rule number one in the Torah, you have to be extremely fearful from God. If you don't have Irat Shamayim, you don't consider a human being. Chazal says, someone without Irat Shamayim is not in the level of a human being. That's why they, they behave like animals in the public, with no shame. Look how people scream, how they curse in the street, how they walk without clothes. Even the President of the United States, this one and the previous fool, in front of a camera with their belly, People take like monkey in a safari. You know how you come to the monkeys and you take pictures of them and they make faces to the camera? Biden is in vacation. Eight years old man walking without shirt. President of the United States. The man with the highest power in, in the world, meaning controls so much power. Like, like a monkey, chimpanzee in the street. And Hussein Obama even worse. Hussein Obama also walked like this naked in front of the camera. A normal president, same thing Putin, show his muscles to the camera. This is the leaders of the world today. If you go to any rabbi in the world, normal rabbi, forget about the biggest in the world, normal, local one. Say, rabbi, I want to make a piece with, to see your muscles to the camera. <laughs> Give him $20,000 cash, he won't agree to take a picture without a shirt. Why? Because he's in a level of a human being. And all these people are in a level of animals. And the sad part is that they control us. Avadim mashlubanu poreket miyadam. I'm saying it's slichot. Slaves took over our life. And we have no remedy from them. No salvation. So Hashem say, what am I asking from you? Only one thing. What? Ki im liira et Hashem elokecha. To fear your God. To follow his path. And to love him. What comes first? Fear. Once you have fear, the love will start to build up. If there is no fear, there is also no love. If you think that you follow Torah and mitzvot out of love, think again, you live in a real illusion. Complete illusion. There's no such thing. The only way to reach love is first to reach fear. That's why it appears in the Torah 18 times, fear. And love only 9 times. And it's a clear verse. What am I asking you to fear me? Once you fear me, you won't commit sins. You won't do horrible things in hidden doors, in hidden rooms. You will think a million times because you know the consequences of what you do because I'm watching you and recording you. Today, when there is a camera, you behave in a certain way. When they take off the camera, your behaving changed 180 degrees. But someone that I feel from God, camera, no camera, there's no difference. Even he's alone in the house, he's always modest. He will never do things that he will do, whether there is a camera or whether there's no camera, because the camera of Hashem always records. And Rabotai, to love your God, listen carefully. In the end of the parasha, it says, if you're going to keep all the commandments that I'm commanding you to do, to love your God, to follow his path, and to stick to him. 
To be attached to him. Ledovka bo. So we have three levels. One level is fear God. Second level, follow his path. Third level is to be attached to him. What's the difference? Many religious people, they fear God. They love God. They follow his path and his ideology of the Torah. But they're not attached to him. You know what it means to be attached to Hashem? That you're so glued to Hashem that nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. It's called, it's written in Tehilim. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. All I see in my life is Hashem. I walk in the street, I see people walk like monkeys and dress like monkeys, I see Hashem. Thank you that I'm not like them, I'm your son. Thanks to your Torah, I'm not monkey like them. I see the thieves in the business, I'm not like them, I see Hashem. Thank you. Thanks to you, I'm not one of those. I see all the losers, the Mechalalei Shabbat, the ungrateful people. They take money from Hashem, take oxygen, use the car on Shabbat against him. I say, thank you, I see Hashem. I see the wicked neighbor, I see Hashem. I see the cars on Main Street on Shabbat, I see Hashem. I see the loser politicians, all the fake liars, I see Hashem. I see the trees, I see Hashem. I see the lemon, I see the orange, I see the, the strawberry, the, the grapes, whatever I see, I see Hashem. That's a very high level, it's called the Kut. When you learn, all you see is Hashem. See the brilliance of Hashem, it's shocking you. Every day you get shocked again and again, how deep it is, how. Wonderful. Pikudei Hashem Misharim Sanchelev. You want to get up and dance? The stipler, the father of Avchaim Kanievsky, when he finished the, the, to learn, he would take the Gemara and dance around the table. The students would pick from the window. They didn't have phones like today. Everything is recorded. They would look at him, how he danced together with the Gemara, with tears of joy. Why? A real happiness. Eternal Unbelievable happiness. So the question, Rabotai, and we finish here, what does it mean, Ule Dovkabo? The Gemara say, how can you be attached to Hashem? Hashem is a fire. Can you attach to the, be attached to the fire? Can you even come near the fire? If the earth will go 1% closer to the sun, in a second we'll all burn out. Or 1% further away, we will freeze to death. Hashem placed the earth from unlimited amount of options, trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of options, here, 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 there's endless amount of options. There's only one out of them that the world could survive. Where? Where it was placed. Any other option, we either burn or die or freeze in a second. The only place that we can live, it's where the earth was placed. And there's still some fools who say, ah, I don't believe in God. Everything was made by a random explosion. Some of them runs the world, these, these clowns. We have to take orders from them. <laughs> Think about it. So the Gemara asks, how can you stick to Hashem? How? The Gemara, and I'm just finishing now, the Gemara say there was a rabbi, his name was Shimon Amsoni. He taught in his yeshiva, a student, a rule in the Torah. Every time the Torah say et, et, it comes to include someone else. Kabed et avicha ve'et imecha, respect your father and your mother. You could have said, kabed et avicha ve'imecha. Why does it say ve'et imecha? It's an extra word, not necessary. To include your older brother. You have to respect your older brother. So he started to go in every time the Torah say et. Et, this et is to include this. This et to include that. This et to include this. Until he came to this verse. Et Hashem elokecha tira. Fear your God, et, fear it. who else? It's supposed to be include someone else. We have et in the verse. Et Hashem elokecha tira. 
He could have said, Hashem Elokech Atira, without et. We would still understand it perfectly. The fact that it says et, it means it comes to include someone else. Rav Shimon Absoni was a very honest rabbi, not a manipulator. And he said to his student, I apologize. Forget everything I taught you. It's incorrect. They said, Rabbi, Rabbi. He said, because every pasuk I explained beautifully. But when it comes to this verse, fear your God, that means that you have to fear someone else. That's against the Torah. You should not fear anyone but God. Fearing another entity, it's heresy. So what should we do? Everything we learn, erase. The same way Hashem will give us a reward for learning, even though we were incorrect, but we try to learn the truth of the Torah. So we get a reward for it. The same way He will give us a reward for stopping and admitting that we were wrong. That's also high level, to be honest. I was wrong. Forget what I just taught you. Later, Rabbi Akiva came and taught everything that Shimon Amsoni taught. When he came to this Pasuk, Et Hashem Eloke Chatira, they asked him, who else you should fear besides God? He said to them, all the Talmidei Chachamim. Every knowledgeable person in Torah, it's like a little God. You have to fear him just like you fear God. When he comes in, you stand, just like the Torah comes out. When he talks, you are quiet. When he comes to sell his merchandise, you close your booth. When he says something, you're not allowed to contradict him. When we walk in the street, you let him walk first. When he comes to get in, you open the, the door for him. When he needs money, you want to give him any amount you can. Rabbi, what do you need? When he needs wine for Kiddush Avdalah, you give him your own wine. Everything he needs, you treat him just like, like you're a servant of the king. Not for him. Not for his beautiful eyes. For Hashem. Because Hashem loves him the most in the world. Because he put 20, 30, 40 years of his life to learn Torah. He now has control and knowledge in the Torah. He teaches Torah. And that's the special unit of Hashem. Loving Him, it's a sign that I love you. Fearing Him, it's fearing you. I don't fear Him because of His hair, because of His beard, because of His nice long coat. That's what I'm fearing. I only fear Him because He has full knowledge. Gemara, Alakha, Musar, lecture, Shurim, knowledge. Give advice to people, tell them what to do, what not to do. Save people life every day. So me, fearing him, fear out of respect, not I fear him that he will punch me. Fear him not to mess with him, not to upset him. Upsetting him meaning I have a problem with Hashem. Just like the boss bring a manager and say to the workers, you have a problem with him. You have a problem with me, not with him. Someone will insult him, will not obey his rules, will disrespect him. I will get one complaint for him about anyone here is done. Why? Who is he? It's not him, it's me. I put him here instead of me. I have to be here and run the show. I'm not going to come and run the show for you. So who did I put to run the show? The rabbis, the people who know Torah, the Dayanim, the Chachamim. If you disrespect them, that means you don't love my Torah, you don't appreciate. It gets much, much worse when they admire all these fools in uh, baseball, football, basketball. They're going to fight to touch some idiot that knows how to shoot a ball or to throw a ball into the net. If you're going to get, uh, one person told me they have a special thing that they protect their teeth. One of them threw it out. The person ran and picked it up with all the germs and sold it for $20,000. Because he was a mouth of this genius that knows how to shoot the basketball. So when you respect such people and the rabbis are nothing for you, you do definitely do not keep Uledovkabo. Ledovkabo 
To be attached to the Chachamim, the Gemara brings a list of things. Fear the Talmidei Chachamim. It means Shimon Amsoni was right all along. When he came to Hashem, he didn't know what does it come to include. Until Baruch Hashem Rabbi Akiva came and said, Uledovka bo, Bet Hashem elokecha tira, lira mea Talmidei Chachamim. The Gemara says, someone that respects the Talmidei Chachamim, his children have much higher chance to be Talmidei Chachamim. Someone that doesn't have boys, only girls, and he respects the Chachamim, his daughters will marry Talmidei Chachamim. Everything in the end is measure for measure. Everything in the end is measure for measure. It's not the same when you sit in a Shabbat table and your father-in-law is a great giant Chacham and the entire Shabbat, everyone's soul comes out like in heaven from the pleasure of the Divre Torah or you have some loser father-in-law all he knows is about to talk about real estate and sport. That's what the Shabbat table is about. It's not the same. The holiness, the lifestyle, the life of the children, it's not the same. The Gemara says you should marry a daughter of a Talmid Chacham. A daughter of a Talmid Chacham. Why? If Chas Shalom she die, who's going to raise the kids? The Talmid Chacham. You marry a daughter of Chas Shalom and Amma Aretz, something will happen to her, who's going to raise the children? Someone who doesn't know Aleph Bet. What kind of Torah the kids will know? The people in today's generation, unfortunately, still, even I'm talking about those who became religious, still have no idea whatsoever how much they have to respect Torah. How much they have to devote everything in their life for Torah. They don't, they don't understand. The, my, my cousin, the big tzaddik, he told me, you know, there's a shul that I go to pray Arvid sometimes. Every time I go in, there's an old man. As soon as he sees me, he runs, he gets sidur, open it, and give it to me open. Filat Arvid. I said to him, why you always give me the sidur? I can take sidur myself. <laughs> he said to him, I try to be Talmid Chacham in my life. Hashem didn't bless me with a sharp brain. I did not succeed in my own learning. Once I, I realized my brain is blocked and I cannot really learn, I say, if I cannot become a Talmid Chacham, how will I be able to fear the Talmidei Chachamim, let me be their servant. I'm in pension, I finish my career, I sit here all day, every time Talmid Chacham come, I run, I give them a sidur, sometimes I make them tea, I serve them tea, I'm happy. I hear Divrei Torah, I respect the Chachamim, and Olam Abba, I will be attached to them. That's why that's we say in Pirkei Avot, make your house a place that gather all the Chachamim. Instead of inviting all the clowns with their nonsense to watch Super Bowl and other nonsense, make sure you make in your house Shiure Torah. Rabbi, can you give a weekly lecture in my house? Whatever it costs, I pay the gas, the tolls, the cab, whatever. I bring food, I encourage people to come, I make phone calls. Shiure Torah in the house? Pure holiness goes into the walls. Pure holiness in everything in your house. Just like today we had a lecture with Eliyahu Navi here. It's not the same. If we were in the right level, we would faint. If a person walk into a room knowing Eliyahu Navi is there, if we were able to see him for a second, we would not faint. If we would see now Eliyahu Navi today in a Brit, we would faint. We'll see Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul, Rav Ovadia, I want to faint. Or Rav Eliashi. Or Baba Sali, or any one of the tzaddikim. See, Eliyahu Navi from 2,400 years ago that the Tanakh say went up to Shammai. Never died. One of the holiest people in the history of the world was here today to be together with us. Will be here for three days. Three days. One time I had a Brit on Shabbat in my house for my wife's cousin and son. Now he's getting married soon. That was 20, 21 years ago. 20 years ago. So one person said, do you mind if I stand you up for three, for three days? I said to him, why? You, you have your own house. 
So now I'm in my house, the Eliyahu Navi wasn't in my house. The Eliyahu Navi will be in my house for three days. You might pay sit here and learn for three days. A person will appreciate what does it mean, Eliyahu Navi, in every Brit Mila. It's not a shalom false belief. Shem told Eliyahu Navi, your punishment is to participate in every Brit Mila. That's why we have the church, it's the Eliyahu. In every Brit Mila. It's the Eliyahu. It's the Eliyahu. We put the baby over there. Why? Eliyahu Anavi. Same thing in Lela Seder. We put the glass, fifth one for Eliyahu Anavi. Why Eliyahu Anavi is so special? He will be the one that will announce the arrival of the Mashiach. Not me, not him, not her. He will say, ladies and gentlemen, the Geulah is beginning. And we are the married today to give Shior with Eliyahu Anavi together. I hope I didn't mess up. Hopefully, Bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow I'll continue in Brooklyn. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen Ve'Amen. Rabbi Hanani, Aben HaKashia, Omer, Atsa, Gadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot Yisrael, Le'etichah, Chirba, Alayim, Torah, Mitzvot, Sh'neemar Adonai, Chafetz, Le'man, Sitkoi, Agdik, Torah.